Rahu Bot. This is I'm Hotep Jed Mutalib Atum L with Golden Moore Services, bringing you another video. Um, this is not a law firm. I'm not a lawyer. I never want to be. I'm just a man showing you the facts. Uh, blessed by the netter to read and comprehend at a pretty decent level so I can bring you guys this, uh, this information. Um, wanted to talk about this case of Holmberg versus Holmberg in uh, Minnesota Supreme Court. This is actually a, a child support case that validates the argument that uh, child support is in violation of um, the separation of powers doctrine uh, contained in the um, in uh, the Constitution. Um, let's look through here. Let's read the syllabus because this is kind of like a synopsis of the whole uh, case opinion being read by one of the Supreme Court justices. So uh, yeah, let's read the syllabus. The administrative child support process created by Minnesota statute subsection 518.5511 in 1996 violates the separation of powers doctrine by infringing on the district court's original jurisdiction. So the district court they're talking about is the state county courts. These are the county courts because, you know, if you look on a map, like um uh don't know where my mouse went oh my mouse actually died i got one of these logitech g7 mouses that's wireless and you got to keep changing the battery on it so let me do that real quick y'all okay so that's actually um let's look at the state of minnesota state court state district court zones we should be able to get an image here of the state of minnesota dun, 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 dun. what's this nah that looks like federal okay all right let's check out this first this is the Court of Appeals, but they don't have territory. That's that's what I'm looking for. Court of Appeals, Court Rules, Library, Supreme Court, uh, Family Law. Okay, never mind. I thought I could find that quickly, but it doesn't look like I can. But hold on, this could be it right here. Okay, yeah, yeah this, is, this is what we're looking for then. Let, let's go to this page. Oh, it's actually on the website. So as actually you can see here that these are all the district courts and the territories and areas all mapped out and color coordinated within the state. This is not federal. This is state uh, district court jurisdiction. So uh, yeah, district courts. Exactly. So this is all your, municip your municipality courts. And there's some appellant courts in here also. I imagine, uh, and I imagine it's one appellant court for each zone here. So going back to um, Holmberg versus Holmberg, <laughs> sorry, kind of forgot there, um, by infringing, so we're gonna go back to it, violates separation of powers doctrine by infringing on the district court's original jurisdiction by creating a tribunal which is not inferior to the district court and by permitting child support officers to practice law. Therefore, the statute is unconstitutional. And like I was saying in the video earlier today, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9, that Congress has the ability to create tribunals, but they have to be inferior, inferior to the Supreme Court and within the state of Minnesota, they got the same clause, which makes this, which makes a child support officer who's trying to execute uh, powers held by a, a judicial officer, AKA judge, even a judge magistrate. People keep saying a judge magistrate is not a judge, but I beg you to look at the delegation of powers doctrine 
and still tell me that that's true. Okay, so therefore the statute is um, unconstitutional. Uh, and let's read. I'll read. Uh, I'll read the, the first three paragraphs, and then we're gonna skip because this is pretty lengthy uh, opinion by the judges. Um, so the instance, the instant case is the consolidation of three appeals to the Court of Appeals challenging the constitutionality of Minnesota's administrative child support process. This appeal pre presents the issue of whether the administrative process, Minnesota statute subsection 518.5511 violates the separation of powers doctrine by impinging upon the original jurisdiction of the district court by creating a tribunal which is not inferior to the district court and by permitting child support officers to engage in the practice of law. Okay, the Court of Appeals ruled the administrative, pro the administrative process unconstitutional, relying on the separation of powers doctrine. We affirm the Court of Appeals and hold that the administrative process is unconstitutional because it violates the separation of powers. Timely and equitable distribution of family financial resources is needed to protect our children's well-being. Thus, the efficient administration of child support cases is a laudable goal and one of the three branches of government share. To this end, the legislature has created an expedited administrative process to adjudicate child support cases, that just means judge, involving families receiving certain types of public assistance and again if your baby moms ain't on public assistance uh the case should be dismissed you need to need to bring that up with a motion while evidence of the administrative child support process efficacy is hotly disputed by the parties there is no controversy about the importance of streamlining child support mechanism nonetheless the importance of the shared goal cannot ignore separation of power constraints. The current child support process is an outgrowth of Minnesota's response to legislation enacted by Congress. When modifying public assistance laws in 1984, Congress mandated that states create expedited administrative and judicial procedures for procuring, modifying, and enforcing child support orders for people receiving public assistance or seeking government help in enforcing child support orders. Well, you can't really seek help until this prerequisite is met. You have to be receiving assistance, which is welfare, TANF, block grants, or seeking, but you can't get the child support order. Legally, you can't get a child support order without seeking public assistance. While all of Minnesota's counties initially were exempted from certain federal mandates, the state decided to improve child support enforcement efforts by establishing a pilot program. I guess it's going to talk about the pilot program here. Not interested. All all right, this one sounds interesting. Let's read this paragraph. In the administrative hearings, L ALJs have all duties, of powers, duties, and responsibilities conferred on judges of district court to obtain and enforce child and medical support and parentage and maintenance obligations, including the power to issue subpoenas, conduct proceedings according to administrative rules in district court courtrooms and issue warrants for failure to appear. In addition, ALJs may modify child support orders, even those granted by district courts. Well, that would be illegal too, right? Because judges can't sit in on child support cases, right? So, you know, it depends on how they do it. I know in California, they sue you they get you into their court. So they're using the district court to get you into their court, which is already a, sep a violation of separation of powers. 
You know, they they can't bounce off each other to try to get you into court and extract money out of you. All right. In addition, L ALJs may modify child support orders even though even those granted by district courts, while ALJs cannot preside over contested pre Okay, here we go. While ALJs cannot preside over contested parentage and contempt proceedings, they can grant stimulated contempt orders and uncontested parentage orders if custody and visitation are also uncontested. All right. So they're saying that they can't, yeah, because uh, judges canons law three, they can't sit in um, child support cases, especially if the parentage is undecided. Uh, in determining that the administrative child support process was unconstitutional, the Court of Appeals relied on the separation of powers doctrine. The Court of Appeals first posited that the executive branch is not to interfere with the courts in their exercise of judicial power, as ALJs are empowered to modify support and maintenance orders originating in district court. The Court of Appeals stated that the administrative process placed ALJs in the constitutionally untenable position of reviewing and modifying uh, judicial decisions. The balance of the court's appeals decisions relied heavily on the seminal separation of powers case Bram, Bramhorst versus Beckman. Citing Bramhurst, the court of appeals stated that the agency's exercise of quasi-judicial power was not unconstitutional as long as the agency's decisions were not only subject to review by certiori, but lacked Ju uh, judicial finality absent a binding judgment entered thereon by a duly established court. I'm talking about a district court, you know, not to certiori is to bring it straight to an appeal. But see, the district court is a superior court when looked at from the perspective of an administrative court, right? That's why in a lot of my cases, I motion to the district court, the municipality, the corporation, uh, because they they are kind of the appeal from the administrative court. And it's a very it's a very cost effective process instead of going straight to federal court. Um, which in some cases, some of these counties, especially out there in Tennessee, uh, those those fucking illegal crime fucking family of judges out there in Memphis, uh, they just throwing people in jail no matter what, no matter what, no matter what you say, uh, they threw my client in jail. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I won't talk about the strategy after that, but it's uh, they don't listen to nothing you got to say. If you don't pay, they just throw you in jail. But it's cool because now they're liable for a lawsuit. Um, and that brings up a great point. Uh, okay, we're good with Minnesota. So the immunity, uh, the immunity clause, that's right, immunity clause. Uh, should be under just here, right? Um, uh, nope, not here. Yeah, let's look at this site. This I like this site because it has everything in one place. And I don't have to go jumping around for it. 14th Amendment. Okay, here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, this is a little bit too much. Issue within five years of its ratification. Nah, we, we just want to look at something really quick. Here's a citizen. <laughs> nah. Clause under the U.S. Constitution. Now they got one for Nigeria too. Go on, Nigeria. Get your constitution on, baby. <laughs> Which does the declare of all states? The Privileges and Immunities Clause, Section 
I mean, Article 4, Section 2, also known as the Comedy Clause, prevents a state from treating citizens of other states. No, 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 that's not what I'm looking for. Let's see something here. Law, doctrines, theories. Okay. All right. So, yeah, okay, I pulled this down. Qualified immunity balances two important interests. The need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly and need to shield a vis and the need to shield officials from harassment, distraction, and liability when they perform their duties reasonably. Uh, Pearson versus Callahan specifically it protects government officials from lawsuits alleging that they violated plaintiff's rights. Uh, only allowing suits where officials violate a clearly established statutory or constitutional right. When determining whether or not a right was clearly established, courts consider whether a hypothetical reasonable official would have known that the defendant's conduct violated the plaintiff's rights. Courts conducting this analysis apply the law that was in force at the time of the alleged violation not the law in effect when the court considers the case. Uh, qualified immunity is not immunity from having to pay money damages, but rather immunity from having to go through the cost of a trial at all. Accordingly, courts must resolve qualified immunity issues as early in the case as, pos as possible, preferably before discovery. Qualified immunity only applies to suits against government officials as individuals, not not suits against the government for damages caused by an official's actions. So uh, I know Yah is magnified, tried to sue, which I give him I give him much props for having the guts to sue. Um, basically, you're suing the state, the state of Virginia. But and this is why the judge threw it out. Now I know he's probably gonna come back with something else because I know he's a smart cat. He'll come back with something else. But this was the reason why, um, you know, that he didn't get that case. He didn't win that case and get and get rewards for damages done, you know. Um, so let's continue on. Although qualified immunity frequently appears in cases involving police officers, it also applies to most other executive branch officials. While judges, prosecutors, legislators, and some other government officials do not receive qualified immunity, most are protected by other immunity doctrines. So there's other immunity doctrines, I guess, for um, legislative or prosecutors or, you know, but um, judges, when they know, knowingly violate the law, that shield of immunity immediately comes down, you know, when you're able to prove it, you know. So I just want to read a couple of paragraphs going back to um, Holmberg versus Holmberg. Um, let's read this. I highlighted some stuff here. As government has grown larger and more complicated, the separation of powers doctrine has become harder to define. Increased use of administrative agencies has further blurred boundaries between government branches and validating administrative agencies located in the executive branch. Courts have characterized agency actions as quasi-judicial, which is illegal, or quasi-legislative, which is also illegal, and mandated stringent standards to check agency activities. Okay. Recognizing the interdependence of the government's branches, we turn to our state constitution's grant of original jurisdiction to the courts. Article 6 of our state's constitution states that the judicial power of the state is vested in a Supreme Court, a court of appeals, if established by the legislature, a district court, and, other such, and such other courts. Remember, those district courts are mostly legislative courts. Uh, though some of these judges 
I mean, they are judges. They do have some limited power and capacity to interpret constitutional uh, laws, especially if the statute goes against the Constitution. But they're to only judge ministerially and they can only judge within the jurisdiction of the statute. It's called statutory jurisdiction. All right. And, and other such courts, judicial of, of officers and commissioners with jurisdiction inferior to the district court as the legislature may establish. If further gives the district court's original jurisdiction in all civil and criminal cases and appellant jurisdiction as prescribed by law. All right. OK. Unlike the tax court. The administrative child support process encompasses an area of the law which arises in equity, meaning contract. All right. Family dissolution remedies, including remedies in child support decisions, rely on the district court's inherent equitable powers. Remember, it's all based on contract. If you didn't sign anything, there's no contract. Thus, Cases involving family law fall within the district court's original jurisdiction. The legislature's delegation of an area of the district court's original jurisdiction calls for this court's close scrutiny. While not binding on this court, we note that the Nebraska Supreme Court has directly addressed the issue of legislation, legislative delegation of a court's uh, equitable power and Drennan versus Drennan. Like the instant case, Drennan involved a challenge to Nebraska's expedited child support system. Nebraska's expedited child support system mandated that certain child support cases, which arise in equity, be channeled into an expedited administrative process rather than the district court. The Nebraska Supreme Court first stated that the district court has original jurisdiction over equitable matters and that the legislature cannot infringe on the district court's equitable jurisdiction. It then held that the expedited system itself, y'all, the expedited system itself was unconstitutional because the system usurped the district court's original jurisdiction by removing certain child support cases from the district court's jurisdiction. Well, you know why they removed it. They removed it because they have a contract with child support. They have a contract with child support. That's why they're removing all the cases in the district court uh, municipality where they had original jurisdiction and they transferred original jurisdiction to an agency. So they're working together and that's why the Supreme Court judges found that this expedited system to get people in there, railroad people, and start getting money out of them is unconstitutional. They, they're saying it right here, right? So ain't, ain't nobody lying about this. So I would advise everybody uh, go and look this case up and read all of it. You know, I just read tidbits here and there because I don't want to take up everybody's time. But... Um, I also don't want to, um, you know, don't believe me, basically what I'm saying. Don't believe me. Go check it out. So another thing I want to look into is um, this, this, the straw man theory. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't believe in it because I haven't seen one case law that says, oh, you know what? You're not that person. You're not the person on capital names. We're going to let you go. I, I've i never seen it. Uh, it's never been in publication because all law has to be um, uh, publicized. Now, I will admit that a person can be a corporation, uh, a trust, a limited partnership. That part is publicized. That part's true. But to sit here and say that, um, uh, I think somebody put up a video uh, drunk driving. Somebody was driving drunk, right? Okay. Somebody was driving drunk and he's in front of the judge and he's saying the judge is like reading off, you know, the events and what he's being charged with. And the guy that says, Oh, well, uh, that, that's not my name in capital letters. I'm only here, uh, to hear the case on his behalf. I'm, I'm the agent. 
A judge is like, oh, you're the agent? Are you the trust? Are you the person? <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm the agent. I'm the agent. I'm not the person in all capital letters. And the judge is like, well, weren't you behind the wheel driving? Physically? And yeah, the guy was like, uh, yeah, that was me. But the name on the, and it just started not to make sense. The guy sounded crazy. And so I want to put y'all on to another dude called Winston Shroud, man. This, now, Winston Shroud, I guess, was a guy who lived in Oregon. And um, he was conducting seminars in this whole UCC. There's a secret bank account and all this bullshit, right? All this bullshit that you can't prove. So it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Because all roads lead the court. <laughs> all roads potentially leave the lead to court so if you're talking this straw man stuff you got no you got no evidence then i suggest you leave it alone now in this case this guy is like the king of the ucc king of the straw man theory this dude's been doing this for like over i think 20 years and come to find out this guy was getting a carpentry pension of like over a hundred thousand dollars a year and the dude was making over like twenty thousand i mean not twenty two hundred thousand dollars in seminars so this dude was greedy and he's full of shit and a lot of people who followed this dude also went to jail for trying to see another winston shroud follower goes to jail you should check this guy out dozy doziak uh does his research uh, actually, let's look at one of his Friday, videos. Winston Shroud was found guilty on 19 federal charges. Found guilty, y'all. Man who failed to pay taxes for 20 years. Pay your taxes. Found guilty on. <laughs> Please pay your taxes. Don't get charges. caught up in this. And um, a federal jury Friday returned across the board guilty verdicts against Winston Shroud, a prominent sovereign citizen charged with 13 counts of issuing fake financial documents to banks and the U.S. Treasury, and six counts of willful failure to pay to file tax returns from 2009 to 2014. Okay, so this guy, he's one of the tax protesters saying, oh, you know, I don't have to pay taxes and all that stuff, which... Which may or may not be true, right? That, that amendment, I think it was the 16th Amendment was never ratified. or Oh, that's what they say. Um, so anyway, uh, this guy is supposed to be like the king of the straw man theory. And I'm and I'm not a, I'm not an agent, but I don't want people uh, going to jail over this bullshit, you know, because he. He made up, you can't make up your own negotiable instrument and then try to send it in and pay something. And if, I put out a challenge out there for everybody, right? You know, if it works, let me see a court opinion that says, you know what, you're, you're, you've been sanctioned and then you've been ordained uh, by the Federal Reserve or some financial institution to create your own negotiable instruments and use it in commerce drawing from a secret bank account that you can't even confirm right i want to see the evidence right i, I want to see the evidence a lot of people talking the legal straw man i know it makes a lot of money for people i know that but it does it doesn't work it it doesn't work i've never seen one case where it works even if the judge wanted to hide it you know uh, a judge wanted to hide it and not give the opinion, which all judges are supposed to give an opinion and a reason why they came to that adjudication. But if they don't give an opinion and people are saying, well, they don't want to let the public know. OK, give me a, give me some paperwork. Give me something. Give me something that says that you beat your case because you said you're not a straw man. I want to see it myself. I want to see it. No one can show me this on the planet, and that's how I know it's fraudulent. All right. So again, watch yourself. Um, make sure you're in the proper status. Make sure you develop a strategy before you go into court. Um, 
Let's learn about it. Because this dude right here, get a good look at him. He's he about to serve 20, baby. He about to serve 20. And I hate to see somebody go down serving 20, sticking to some legal straw man issue. If you sign a contract, that's you. That's that's the name your mama gave you, ain't it? Okay, then don't stop saying that's not you. You look stupid. You look stupid. You look dumb. All right? So qu quit all this sovereign citizen crap. Uh, pay your taxes unless you're doing like all cash transactions. You, you're probably good. But if you're doing electronically, the feds can bring that shit up at any time during an inquiry, man. Just pay your taxes. Tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion is illegal. So you can lower it. You can come up with a tax scheme to pay damn near nothing in taxes. But you got to know how to do it. You know, so, you know, be smart, guys. Be smart. You know, and my challenge still stands. Show me the evidence that the straw man works. Because if you murder somebody, you murder somebody. You're not going to say, oh, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm a straw man, so uh, or I'm not the straw man. I didn't do it, it you know. And peace to the brothers out there who were in prison, and uh, and they really didn't do shit. And the prosecution was just vicious, and they just wanted to paint the blame on somebody who wasn't even really involved, especially if it's a racial issue. You know, what I'm saying, you know, I, my heart goes out to cats like that. You know, keep your head up, baby, um, and. If you serve 10 or 15 and you shouldn't have, you sue, you just sue the county, you sue the state for as much money as you can. Because those are years you just can't get back. So anyway, I'm going to end the video on that. Um, again, you can come to uh, www.goldenmoreservices.com. We'll be able to help you out. Numbers here. Log in. Get you an account. Uh, you can book an appointment with me. Um, I have blogs here. I wrote two, and this one I haven't written yet. But uh, yeah, you can see I I wrote these, and I actually wrote this too, but uh, my name ain't up there. So yeah. So uh, anyway, you guys have a good one. Peace to the God. Peace to the brothers out there in the struggle. Uh, peace to everybody from California, Southern Cali. That's where I'm from. Uh, and uh, and I'm out. Till next time. Peace.